I can't stop giving thanks to God that someone who was born under three pounds has such a powerful lungs. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, and God bless you. Happy Sabbath, church. God is good. And all the time, he's certainly good. I, re I remembered when Kathy got married, Kathy and Dan. I remember when Azibo got married. I remember when Mark left for college. I remember when Sister Kathy Boyle came here. And I remember most of you, if not all of you. You see, I have been longer a member of this church than I've been pastor. And I want to continue to be a member of Ypsilanti as long as you permit me to. Thanks to Sister Roberta Brazil for stepping in line. Yeah. We love you, Sister Brazil, and not wanting to go far afield, but while I was going through some documents in the pastor's office, I saw the picture of Brother John. So I remember when Brother John was here. I remember Sister Shori was here. I remember when Sister Dabney was here. I remember when Brother George Davis was here. I remember when Sister June Moore was here. And Alicia Moore was here. And uh, Daryl Brown's daughter, what's her name? That passed away? Yes, I remember all of those. The reason for saying remembering is that uh, a part of our scripture reading this morning, Jesus was asking the folks, saying, I will not drink of this wine until I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. But prior to that, in the text, he says, do it as often in remembrance of me. So we're going to do a remembrance today. Let us pray. Father God, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you for saving us from our sins giving your only son, Jesus, to die in our place. Speak to each one of us through your word. What we have not in your mercy and your grace, give it unto us. What we are not, by your love and power, make us today and give us the enlightenment in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Future perfect. Or you can even switch it around. Perfect future. It does not matter. There are events that take place in our lives that we don't forget or will not forget. Some of these begin simply with an invitation that asks for a répondé s'il vous plaît, reply if you please, RSVP. And most of such invitations come in the form of a wedding, a supper for an anniversary, or some sorts. And oftentimes, if the invitation is incomplete, we ask the question, what is it again? Where is it going to take place? And sometimes we ask 
for special menu items? Is there going to be some bus up shot? Some roti? Is there going to be some special pies made for us? We ask all these questions because we recognize that fellowship is important and socializing is endorsed, supported, affirmed by God. So when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in the book of Luke, Matthew 26 and 29 as I've read, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus was saying, in other words, there is another occasion coming when I will drink this with you, but under different circumstance. In Luke 22, verse 16 and 18, he says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. First Corinthians, Paul recounting his understanding of the occasion, chapter 11 and verse 26, says this of Jesus. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In each of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, as well as in 1 Corinthians, there is direct information about the institution of what we call the Lord's Supper. A key element in our own celebration today is that the Lord's Supper is not only present as we partake, but it's also future looking in a perfect manner and in a perfect place. As a matter of fact, Luke 14 and verse 15 says, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. That was one who was at the dinner in Luke 14. So Jesus, in order to remind everyone that were partaking in the Lord's Supper of the occasion, arrested their memory of many occasions when he spoke of banquets and suppers. He often alluded to the great feast in the kingdom of God, both in parables and in direct comments. For example, the parable of the great banquet at a dinner to which Jesus was invited he told his host not to invite those who would and could invite him back, but to go out to the, in this great banquet in the parable and invite all who may come in. Everyone is invited. A perfect invitation from a perfect Lord. Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God, Luke 14, 15. Jesus followed with the parable of the great banquet, the point of which was that the Jews 
would be displaced by the Gentiles if they don't make sure of the RSVP. Jesus told of the rewards of the apostles. Luke 22, he says, and verse 29, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on my thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the reward of the apostles about this great banquet. There were teachings of inclusion and exclusion. People will come from east, west, north, and south, and will take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. And many that are hearing his voice will be left out. I pray, God, that as we attend to this Lord's Supper today, everyone responds positively, saying, Jesus, thank you for allowing me to sit at your table one more time in anticipation of the great and noble day when I shall sit with all the saints of old and all the saints that are yet to be and fellowship at your table. Jesus also told the parable of the 10 versions, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the time come when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Being in Abraham's bosom pictures a place of honor, a place of love, and intimate fellowship. This and these are indications of Jesus and the great banquet. But in the book of Revelation, it also refers to the great banquet in a promise to overcomers in the letter to the churches, Jesus says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, Brother Paul, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. The right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God, Revelation 2.17. Revelation culminates or ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb. So Jesus, in the communion service, says, I will not eat with you again until I eat with you in the kingdom of heaven. And prior to that occasion, he gave many references to a feast to a banquet in Revelation 22. He spoke of it again, but here in Revelation 2 and verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give right to eat from the tree of life. Revelation says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. By the way, finally then represents the righteousness of Christ. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I pause, because it's not a nice thing when you are supposed to be a contemporary of a lot of individuals, a colleague of the group, and everyone receives an invitation and you don't get one. You start thinking, am I forgotten? Or is it that they don't want me to come? What is it? And sometimes we are tempted to think negative thoughts. But Jesus says, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words 
of God. So the great banquet is to take place. And with that kind of introduction of the Lord's Supper and the parables that I've mentioned, I tell you, becomes very relevant. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. At the first feast he attended with his disciples, it was not a church service. The first feast that Jesus attended with his disciples was nothing but a grand and special occasion of abundance. Jesus gave to his disciples the cup that symbolized the work for his salvation. And at the Last Supper, he gave it again as an institution to remember the Last Supper. What was the occasion? Jesus had just been tempted by the devil three times and overcame. Ready to begin his ministry, he invited some to join him as they get back from Galilee, from, sorry, from Judea to Galilee. And while in Galilee, Jesus heard about this wedding. As a matter of fact, it is told that the wedding was a wedding of relatives. And just a little village over from Capernaum called Canaan, Jesus decided to show up. And as he was there, his mother began to recount all that she heard, all the wonderful passages of scripture that angels encountered that gave to her. And Jesus silently took his place in a corner with his disciples and Mary came to him and says, they are out of wine. Jesus' response was, what is that to me? And she ignored his 20th century impulse of being obstinate, but in Jewish tradition it was respectful and honorable for him to answer that way. And she said to the people around, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And the Bible says that there were six stone jars empty at the door of the wedding place. And Jesus told the handlers, fill the jars with water. They willingly obeyed. Then he says, throw it out now and take it to the governor of the feast. And as, he took it to the gov as they took it to the governor of the feast, there was astonishment, there was consternation, there was amazement, there was a gasp of, woo, this is the real thing. And by the way, Ellen White says that it was grape juice, pure, unadulterated, undefiled grape juice of the highest order. And it, the governor's comment was, Usually, and by the way, weddings in those times used to take many days. And so you offer to the guest the best first. And then, as that is out, then you kind of gather up what you can to make some more. So Jesus says, the governor said, usually the best wine is served first, Sister Kati but you have kept the best for last. And they had a party. They had a party. What is significant about this is that Jesus celebrates abundance and social gatherings. His first act of miracle was not in a church, but at a wedding as an indication that my ministry has some significance, that this first celebration that I engage myself with you will happen over and over until that day 
when I celebrate it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The wine which Christ provided for the feast and that which he gave to the disciples as a symbol of his own blood was the pure juice of grape. It was Christ who in the Old Testament gave the warning to Israel. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. It is he himself provided no such beverage. Satan tempts men to indulge that their minds will be clouded and benumbed and their spiritual perceptions will be hindered. But Christ teaches us to bring the lower nature into subjection so he give us the best. Amen? So along with the occasion, which is a banquet, there's going to be a wedding taking place, Brother Rick. And this we must also remember. Revelation 19, 6 and 9 talk about the Lamb's wedding. Revelation 19, 7 speaks about his wedding feast. Revelation 19, 9, and also we read in John 14, 1 to 3 that he's gone to prepare a place for us. How does a wedding feast show us that God wants us near him always? And that is, you cannot have a wedding without a bride. Jesus left his home 2,000 years ago, brethren, to invite followers to what we call a wedding feast, a wedding supper. And all those who are ready and will be ready have one ingredient of obedience, and that is to put on the robe of the king. If you go into the wedding feast on your own and decide that you want to dress the way you want to dress, you may be or you will be cast out. For the only qualification to enter into the wedding feast is the robe that the king provides. And we understand that robe to be the robe of righteousness. So everyone must read it. This supper will happen after, the marriage, after Christ marries his bride. In other places in the Bible and in the writings of Ellen White, a bride is a word picture of the church. But the word bride in Revelation has a different meaning. Ellen White explains, the holy city is named the New Jerusalem. This New Jerusalem is the bride, the Lamb's wife. The book of Revelation shows us God's people as guests at the Lamb's wedding. So otherwise, it's the church, but in this context, it is the new Jerusalem, and you and I are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. We've got to make that clear in our distinction. Again, in other places, the church is the bride. But in the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem is the bride. In other words, the new Jerusalem without saints does not happen. The new Jerusalem without people like you and I will not be possible, for we've got to be able to come together, the church in the new Jerusalem, celebrating the marriage of the Lamb. So if God's people are his guests, then they cannot also be the bride. The Great Controversy, page 426 and 427, explains it all. After Jesus paid the price for our sins at Calvary, and to show that he was good for his bride, which is the New Jerusalem, he went back to heaven to make it ready for you and I as guests. Revelation 19.8 says, Jesus gave his bride clean white clothes to wear. Clean, white clothes are a word picture for Jesus' holy life. That shows us something important about the guests who live in the city. It shows us that they obey God's law. It also shows us that the good things that they come to do only comes from God and God who lives in them. 
So while Jesus was on earth, he told a picture story about a wedding feast, which I've already recounted in Matthew 22. One of the guests decided to wear his own clothes, not the wedding clothes that the king gave him. When the king saw this man, the king commanded his servants to throw the man out of the room. Revelation 3.18 shows us that God's people living in the end time need the clothes that he has for them. Jesus tells his people in the end time to buy these clothes from him. That shows us that he wants us to give up something to get the clothes. He wants us to give up our trust in ourselves and our trust in others and take on the trust in him. So our trust in God is the only thing that will save us. May God grant us trust. Quickly, we have established that there is an event and it is called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. One of the important things about an invitation is the menu. And in this menu, after we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went to the city. What's the menu? Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done thy will, my will. You have suffered for me. Come to the supper, for I will gird myself and serve you. We shouted, Hallelujah, and entered the city that's selling white. And I sat at the table and saw what it looks like. Ellen White says it looked like pure silver. It was many miles in length. And if you learn Revelation correctly, the perimeter of the new city, Jerusalem, is 1,500 miles. And if it's a city four square, it means that one side is about 375 miles. And Ellen White says, as she sat at the table with undimmed, immortalized eyes, she could see everyone as clearly and distinctly to the end of the table. So she will see Varric there, and she will see Rick there, and she will see Roberta there, and Abby there, and Rosalind and Janet. She will see everyone distinctly, and you and I, Thank God we'll be able to see each other just as distinct as well. I do not know what you call that. Not 2020, but maybe 100, 100. But the vision will be perfect. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life. And she says something interesting. I never thought of this before until I was doing the study. I saw the fruit of the tree of life. Now the Bible says it bare 12 manner of fruits, isn't that right? Ellen White identified some of the fruits. She did not list mango, neither pineapple nor strawberry, but she says almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruits. So perhaps mango is included in many other kind. But one that she mentioned, Sister Perry, is very distinct. The first mention, and I'm going to ask the congregation, what is typically referred to as angel food? What is typically referred to as angel food? Manna. That's absolutely correct. Ellen White mentioned the manna. Let me read it again. I saw the fruit of the tree of life. The manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. Confession, I never thought that manna was going to be there as a fruit. But Ellen White says it. I still believe in Ellen White. Do you? I asked Jesus to let me eat the fruit. She said, not now. Those who eat of the fruit of this land go back to earth no more. But in a little while, if 
faithful, everybody, including the preacher. You shall both eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink of the water of the fountain. And he said, you must go back to the earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. What a letdown. But the future is still bright, brethren. The future is still perfect. So along one of the memories coming from the tree of life, another part of the menu, we read it in our scripture reading, I will not drink of you until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So we have fruits and wine. Fruits and wine. Jesus did not begin his ministry by some great work before the Sanhedrin. But as I said before, he began it with wine. And not the fermented stuff that men imb imbibe today to make them drunk, but the fruit of the vine, the non-alcoholic beverage. It was the customs of the time for marriage festivities to go for many days, and in those days as the wine ran out, as I mentioned before, Jesus provided just the right for them. What else was on the menu? Does anybody know? We have fruit from the tree of life. We have wine. Didn't Jesus say to the disciples, not only I will not take, eat, this is my body. And did he not say to the Pharisees and the scribes, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And Jesus, did he not say, I am the manna that came down from heaven. So figuratively and symbolically, that which is going to be eaten has to have its culmination, has to have its extent of all embodiment that contain everything that is right and good in Jesus himself. So if you eat the manna without reflecting on Jesus, you are not doing it correctly. If you eat the bread without reflecting on Jesus, you are not doing it correctly. If you eat the lamb's meat without reflecting on Jesus, you're not doing it correctly. And did you know, as a reminder, that at the Passover, it was lamb's meat that they were eating. So they were eating lamb, they were eating wine, and they were eating from the fruit of the tree of life. Grapes, grape juice. When you and I celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we partake, all of these symbols point to one thing, and that is the life of Jesus Christ. So as we partake today, let us partake in such a way that we are eating of the tree of life. Let me close with one other thought. So we have the place, we have the, okay, we have the occasion rather, the event which is the banquet of the Lord. We have some of the menu. And where did Jesus say he's going to do this? Drink it anew. Anybody? I drink it anew where? In my Father's kingdom. So he's going to drink it anew in his Father's kingdom. This is my body of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit which contains all manner of fruits but it's always described as fruit singular, the same way Sister Perry, as the fruit of the Spirit, which is one fruit, but is divided into love, joy, peace, long-suffering, compassion, brotherly kindness, and so forth. So it is a single fruit. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 13, 43 says, 
Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 25, 34 says, Then shall the king say unto them on the bright hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So I am invited to the kingdom. You are invited to the kingdom. Luke 12, 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 22 and verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Luke 22, 30, Then ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So I, I'm invited to a kingdom. I'm invited to a feast. I'm invited to a fellowship. And the, inv in the person who does the invitation is none other than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I accept and I need to prepare and I want to be ready. And Jesus says, come, come by faith to the garment room. Come and take up your robe of righteousness and be blessed. So finally, here it is, Revelation 22 and verse two. The perfect future, an event a menu and a place, which he says is the kingdom of God. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, plural, and yielded our fruit, singular, every month. So you may choose the manna month, you may choose the grape month, the pomegranate month, the almond month, or one of the months. And the Bible says, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. We shall be completely restored as we feast on the tree of life, hallelujah. Out of the throne came a pure river of water and on either side of the river was the tree of life. The fruit was glorious. It looked like mixed, like gold mixed with silver. And I plan to be there, brothers and sisters. And even though this officially is slated to be my final message to you in my capacity as pastor, I want to be under the tree of life and I'm inviting you, echoing the invitation of Jesus, come with us under the tree of life for party time. Come, let's celebrate the great goodness of Jesus. Whether you like pomegranate or mangoes, whether you eat manna for the first time or you want to just drink the grape juice, come, let us celebrate. And thank God I'm going to have a hundred to a hundred. And Enoch, Enoch, if you wait down at the other end, I'm going to see you, brother and we're gonna be able to gather. This is a beautiful place. So I wanna make an appointment with Ipsy. A simple but meaningful appointment. On the day of the Great Supper, in the kingdom of God, when the menu is special, I want to see you there. I plan to be there and I want to see you there. So the only way for me to get there is to say, Jesus, I accept you as Christ, who is the anointed one. Jesus, I accept you by faith that you died in my place. Jesus, I accept that you not only died in my place, but you rose again. Jesus, I accept you not only that you rose again, but that you ascended to heaven at last and that you're there preparing a banquet for me. 
and that my place is reserved under the tree of life. And Jesus, I am going to wear not anything that I want to, but I choose your robe of righteousness. I choose your white robe of cleansing. So Jesus, RSVP positive. I am replying to your invitation, please. And I'm positively attending. How about Ipsy today? Amen? Amen. The fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden possessed supernatural virtue. To eat of it was to live forever. Its fruit was the antidote of death. Its leaves were for the sustaining of life and immortality. After the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 288. The redeemed saints who have loved God and kept his commandments here will enter in through the gates of the city and have the right to the tree of life. They will eat of it freely as our first parents did before they fail. The leaves of that immortal widespread tree will be for the healing of the nations. All their woes will then be gone. Sickness, no more. Sorrow, gone. Death, no more. They will never again feel hungry or thirsty, for the leaves of the tree have healed them all. Jesus will then see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied when the redeemed who have been subject to sorrow, toil, and afflictions, who have grown beneath the curse, are gathered around the tree of life to eat its immortal flight. When Winston Patterson gathers around the tree, when Jerry Body gathers around the tree, when Alexis Lee gathered around the tree, when Willie Harrison's gathered around the tree, when Gloria Patterson gathers around the tree, when Mavis Alfred gathers around the tree, when all of God's children Everyone present here and those who are resting in the grave gathers around the tree. It will be a perfect time of praise and hallelujahs. Amen. Upon the tree was most beautiful fruit, Ellen White says, of which the saints could partake freely. The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the matchless depths of the Savior's love. Early Writings, page 289. What a fellowship it will be. For one reason or another, I speak positively of all present here today, but all are not present. The sudden part of reality is there are Christians who, for one reason or another, no longer attend church. They say the church is flawed. They've been hurt in the church. The church is filled with hypocrites and so forth. And these things are often true. But you and I, by God's grace, will not give up. Amen? Our invitation is to the tree of life, and that's where we must be, Brother Rick. Let us not give up meeting together, Ipsy as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. Make it to church. I'm praying for you. I love you. I forgive you. I'm sorry. Whatever it takes for us to be together at the tree of life, let us do it by the grace of God. And all the more as you see the perfect day appearing, Hebrews 10, 25. For in our future is a seat at the great banquet table with millions of other fellow believers and perhaps billions, I don't know. Isn't it ironic that we should separate ourselves now when we're hoping that we're going to be together then? Can't work. We must first come together now. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen? So the Lord's Supper is a promise of the future. The Lord's Supper is a reminder that this life isn't as good as it gets. Just as the seal of the Holy Spirit is your guarantee of your future glory. So the piece of bread today and the portion of wine today 
you will hold in your hands are a token of your ticket to the great banquet at the end of age. Take it, eat it, drink it by faith, and may the Lord bless you. No one, no one has seen God at any time. Jesus said that, John 1:18. 1 John 4, 12. And by that, it means no one has seen God's essential spirit nature. But on the perfect day, when saints from north and south and east and west are gathered together, and as the scripture says, when we beheld the glory of the Lord, they, according to Revelation 22 and verse 4, shall or they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever and ever, and the banquet will continue forever and ever and ever, and the tree of life will continue to bear 12 manner of fruits forever and ever and ever, and by God's grace, I will be there forever and forever and forever. And what about you? Will you be there forever? I tell you, Matthew 26 and verse 29, our scripture reading, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Ipsy, get ready to eat and drink in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise of drinking and eating one day with you in your kingdom. We thank you for the death of Jesus, for his resurrecting power. And as we prepare now in the washing of our feet, eating of bread and drinking of wine, may we do so with a great anticipation that one day soon we shall all be gathered around the tree of life and to celebrate forever and ever. Forgive us of our sins and may each be given by your grace and mercy that robe of righteousness which entitles us to a place in your eternal kingdom. Bless us to this end, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen.